Welcome back to True Crime and Wine. How's everyone feeling tonight? Wow, cheers. All 4,000 and 6,000 of you that watch the true crime videos that take me 24 hours to edit. Anyways guys, welcome back to True Crime and Wine. I don't have a glass of wine because it is daytime out. If anyone watched my last week's True Crime and Wine, I did Ed Kemper, the co-ed killer, and in the middle of filming it at nighttime, it was like some type of ghost or someone was in the room with me and I was just like, I'm off this. So I decided I'm going to film during the day instead. So here I am filming for y'all during the sunlight. I don't know why I just did that for five minutes. It's like I was having a thought while I was doing that and then the thought, got me distracted about what I was even doing and then I had to remember what I was doing and now I'm back. Does that make sense? And then I just instantly got this like throbbing headache. Get it together. For anyone who was here last week and watched Ed Kemper, the co-ed killer, the co-ed butcher, I mentioned in that video that at the same exact time, Ed was terrorizing co-ed hitchhikers. There was two other serial killers in Santa Cruz that made Santa Cruz get the nickname, the Myrtle. Why can I never say that even in the last video I can say it? Murder, capital of the world. world. I told you that I would talk about those other two killers in the next two videos. So today, our true crime video is on John Lindley Fraser. Johnny Boy, I hate the name John. I hate that name. But we're going to talk about John Lindley Frazier today. We're going to figure out what he was doing when Ed Kemper was out there killing folks too. So let's get into it. John Lindley Frazier was born in 1946. 1946. That sounds so long ago when you say it, but I guess he wasn't really... I guess it's really not that long ago. It's just when you say 40 or 30 or 20, it's like, damn, that's a long ass time ago. But he was born in 1946. He was described to be a normal, well-groomed, smart, happy, loving individual. And then shit took a turn for the worst. But before I actually get into what happened to John, I'm going to start with John's crimes. And then we'll get into what happened before John's crimes. Let's switch it up, shall we? Let's change it up a bit. Let's Switch it up, Danielle. Yes, go ahead, you switch it up, girl. Switch it up on him. I'm gonna tell you what he did and then how he became to do it. On Monday, October 19th, 1970, firefighters were called to put out a fire that set a blaze to a large mansion, a wealthy home, in an upscale area in Santa Cruz, California. 
This was 15 months after the Charles Manson murders. Now I have not covered Charles Manson on my true crime, but of course you guys know I'll eventually get to that. But this, this particular night, this particular crime was 15 months after the Charles Manson murders. So when the firefighters arrived to the scene, they could not enter up these two dirt roads because a Rolls Royce and a Lincoln Continental were blocking both roads that were leading up to the house that was on fire. So finally, when they get past this little obstacle course, they head to the house, they try to put the fire out, they realize nobody's home, they're thinking, oh, thank God, this is just a house that burnt down, nobody's home, nobody's hurt. And then one of the firefighters went to the back where there was a pool and there was one body floating at the top of the pool so he flashed his flashlight on it looked at the bottom of the pool and realized there was four other bodies that had sunk to the bottom of the pool my first indication was it was a mannequin and the first boy I saw but then it, when I saw the others I knew they were people This wasn't just a fire, y'all. This was a mass murder. Security was set up at all entrances leading to Dr. Ota's mountaintop home after firemen responding to a fire in that home Monday evening discovered the bodies of Dr. Ota, his wife, Virginia, sons Derek, 12, and Taggart, 11, and his secretary, Dorothy Cadwallader. All were found shot to death their bodies thrown into the Ota swimming pool. The bodies belong to Dr. Victor Ota, his wife Virginia, his two sons, Derek and Taggart, and his secretary, Dorothy Cadwalder. I might be saying that wrong, I'm so sorry, I'm not the best at names. His secretary, Dorothy, was also married and had two little children of her own. The bodies were tied with the doctor's scarves. He used to buy really nice scarves, expensive scarves, so the bodies were actually tied in his own scarves. They were blindfolded. His wife was gagged. Santa Cruz County Sheriff Doug James, heading the investigation here, told reporters earlier at his office that the victims had also been bound with silk scarves. Dr. Ota was shot three times in the back with a 38 caliber. The other victims, which were his wife, his two children and his secretary were all shot in the neck with a 22 caliber. All murders were done at a close range execution style, and this was the first mass murder Santa Cruz had ever had. Five victims were shot in the back of the head. Dr. Ota twice, each of the others once. Senseless, savage, the worst crime in the county's history. These, some of the phrases people here are groping for to try to express their shock and revulsion at the crime. Little fires were set all across the house by the murderer. Luckily, none of the fires really took, but investigators and detectives that were on the scene, including firefighters, realized that no expensive items were taken. Everything seemed to be left in place. So they ruled out this murder being a robbery. I would have ruled out, I would have ruled it out being a robbery the minute I realized they were one shot execution style and were tied up. Because most robberies, like, I mean, I guess you get tied up in a robbery, but I don't think most robberies would bring you to a pool and like knock you in a pool. That just doesn't make sense to me. But I guess because of the expensive items still being in the house, detectives were like, whoop, this is not a robbery. Yeah, no shit, Sherlock. So just a little history on the family. Dr. Victor Ota was a very successful eye doctor, but also he was philanthropic. He used to help out in the community. People you refer to him as being a wonderful doctor, an even better citizen, and an amazing friend. His family was very tight-knit, close, oh, it's so awful. He had two sons, but also two daughters, and the two daughters were actually away at school at the time, so they were not home at the time of the murder, which was kind of a blessing, but also kind of like, damn, knowing your whole family got murdered in such a terrible way, I just, I just awful. Both of the daughters were away at school. Dr. Ota had been practicing ophthalmology in Santa Cruz since 1960, maintaining an office in Santa Cruz and in Gilroy. He specialized in cataract surgery. Two other members of the Ota family, two daughters of Dr. Ota, escaped the horror which struck here. They are both away at boarding school. Dr. Ota was very wealthy. He had nice cars. He would buy his wife nice jewelry. He would put his kids in expensive private schools. He would have nice clothing, such as scarves. Very rich, very wealthy, 
but also did good things with his wealth. Now when they first arrived at the scene, the firefighters and the Rolls Royce was blocking off one road getting to the house and the Lincoln was blocking off the other road. The Rolls Royce was actually Dr. Ota's and the Lincoln Continental was his wife Virginia's. But Virginia also had a green station wagon which was missing. So the murderer took Virginia's station wagon, left the scene of the crime in it, and the cops were like, okay, if we find the car, we'll find the killer. Also in the house was an empty box of 22 caliber shells, and a gun was missing from the Ota's residence, which means the killer took one of the guns from the family home. So it wasn't John's gun, it was Dr. Ota's gun which he took. Detectives also noticed that in the house, all the phone cords were cut, every single one of them. So they realized this wasn't a robbery, this was a planned, thought out, well prepared mass murder. The questions to be answered of course at this point are who and why. And at the moment, one of the best leads in hopes of finding that answer is a 1968 green Oldsmobile Vista Cruiser with license plates WZH511. It belongs to Dr. Ota and it's missing. So when investigators go down to the cars, the Rolls Royce and the Lincoln Continental, they see that there's a typewritten note left in the windshield wiper of the Rolls Royce. Now I'm gonna read to you what it said. I obviously don't have this memorized, you guys. Sorry, so I'm just gonna read to you what the typewritten note said. It said, dated Halloween 1970, which doesn't make sense because honestly, it was the 19th of October, 1970 not Halloween, but whatever. The note said, today World War III will begin as brought to you by the people of the free universe. From this day forward, anyone or company of persons who misuses the natural environment or destroys same will suffer the penalty of death by freedom against any single anyone who does not support natural life on this planet. Materialism must die or mankind will. The note was signed, Knight of Wands, Knight of Cups, Knight of Pentacles, Knight of Swords. The tarot card signature actually sparked terror into investigators because this was 15 months after the Charles Manson murder and they were thinking, oh my god, is this another cult? Do we have another cult that's going to hit the streets and start committing these mass murders? They also realized that the person committing the murders had an issue with the fact that Dr. Ota and his family were wealthy and rich and were quote unquote misusing their wealth and killing the environment with how they're spending their money, what they're spending their money on. So whoever it was, was doing this to teach the world a lesson or to teach this family a lesson and to spread the word and the gossip of we need to take back the natural environment. Stop buying expensive cars, stop living in expensive mansions, just stop. Which is the dumbest shit ever because even if we all lived in shacks and lived in nature. Nature would still somehow be probably falling apart. That's just my opinion. I could be wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that people who are wealthy and spending money on wealthy things means they don't care about the environment. Like for instance, look at Leonardo DiCaprio. Mother is rich and he's one of the only people on my Instagram that's a celebrity that is just going so hard on getting the message across about global warming and animals and the earth survival. So I don't think that rational thought process makes sense. This per John sounds like a crazy person, but when crazy people think that their ideas are crazy, they think their idea is crazy. You know what I'm saying? I hope I made sense there. I hope I like my thought came out like it wasn't crazy because I ain't no crazy bitch. But I think it made sense. I hope it made sense to you guys. It made sense to me when I was saying it. Word spread that the Ota family was killed in execution style in the newspaper and all around the town. And investigators knew that the hippies were on the rise. At this time, hippies were becoming a thing. People were smoking weed, doing drugs. And you know, Charles Manson's murder crew 
was considered to be like kind of in the hippie culture. So they didn't want people to blame the hippies for this mass murder if they weren't 100% sure that it was in fact hippies that committed it. So investigators decided to leave the typewritten note that was left on Dr. Ota's windshield wiper out of the press because they didn't want to spark even more terror. Because at this point, people are buying guns, they're strapping up on weapons because they're like, yo, no one's gonna break in my house and kill me this way too. So to kind of protect themselves and the citizens of the town, they were like, let's leave this letter out. Let's just not even bring it up. So the catalyst was this hippie store that was on the corner of whatever town, the town that the Otis lived in, in Santa Cruz. And at the time they were getting multiple bomb threats about from random people saying we're gonna blow your spot up. A lot of people didn't like hippies back then. Their culture and their hangout spots was feared by quote unquote normal, regular citizens. And the only reason I'm even mentioning this catalyst hippie store is because it comes into play later on in the story. So keep that in mind, don't forget it, because we're coming back to it. So investigators did put out word that Mrs. Ota's car got stolen. It's a green station wagon, and if anyone could send in some tips, please call the tip line, let us know if you've seen it, because if someone, if we can find this car, we can find the killer. The Santa Cruz tip line actually got a tip from a gas clerk, cashier, who said he had a small interaction with a guy in a green station wagon. He said he heard his voice, but did not see his face. Another person called the Santa Cruz tip line and said that a green station wagon was set on fire in the woods. So the cops go, they're like, okay, if we go right now and we get to this wagon, we can catch the killer. So they do go to the woods, they do smell fire, follow the scent, find the car. The green station wagon is in fact set ablaze, burnt to shit, and the murderer, literally dipped and was nowhere to be found, completely out of their grasp. They still had no clue who they were looking for, what they could possibly be getting themselves into. All they found was the burnt station wagon. Outside of her vehicle were footprints, but they couldn't tell if it was one pair of footprints, multiple pair of footprints, one suspect, multiple suspects. They don't know who they're looking for, what they're looking for, is it a group of people? one person? Is it five people? Is it 20 people? Is it a hundred people? Who are we looking for? And how did we not catch anyone in the woods? If the car was still on fire when we arrived, where could they have gone that quickly for them to slip through our grasp? Searching the heavily wooded area around Henry Cowell State Park northeast of Santa Cruz for any trace of the up to three people various witnesses have placed near the Ota car. The car was found in a railroad tunnel in the park Tuesday evening. It had been driven down the tracks, set afire, and was later struck by a Southern Pacific switch engine. Impounded by authorities now, the car shows the obvious damage inflicted by the impact of the train car collision and inside some fire damage. Investigators talked to the Ota's close family and friends. They were asking questions and they found out while doing these interviews that on the day of the murder, Dorothy, the secretary of Dr. Victor Oda, actually brought one of the sons home from school earlier, and then Dr. Ota picked up the other son and brought him home later. So that proved to investigators that they did not arrive at the house at the same exact time, so the murderer must have been in the house waiting for everyone to arrive home. Again, suggesting and signifying that this was planned. Somebody planned these murders. So now that the cops still have absolutely nothing to go off of, they don't know what they're looking for, who they're looking for, is this a cult, is this one individual, they decide that it's time to release the typewritten note to the press because maybe, just maybe, someone will recognize the jibber jabber or how the person signed the letter. So they release the note to the press. Now there was a hippie from the Catalyst store, remember I, remember, remember I brought up the Catalyst a little? a little bit ago. Well, there was a hippie from that store who did recognize his signature that was on the typewritten note and asked to have a private meeting and remain unknown with the FBI. So at 3 a.m., three days after the murder of the Ota family, this hippie has a private meeting with District Attorney Peter Chang. The hippie said that the dude kept coming into the catalyst named John Frazier, and he would he would talk gibberish about how materialism needs to be wiped off the earth, and he would refer to himself while talking about all these prophecies and ideologies as exactly how he signed the note. 
king of cups, king of pentacles, pentacles, king of wands, king of swords. He referred to himself like that at the catalyst and that's why this hippie who had this private meeting knew exactly who wrote it as soon as he saw it in the newspaper the hippie didn't have much information other than that on him that his name was john frazier he didn't know where he lived or where he hung out or anything like that so investigators started doing some digging and they found an auto body shop that john used to work at so they you know get in their little cop cars and they head on over to the auto body shop auto body shop did i just say that right that sounded weird so detectives interview the owner of the auto body shop. He said that John has not worked there in over a year. He described him as clean cut, well-mannered, hard worker, married man, nice, and that he just suddenly stopped working. He just up and quit a year ago. The owner of the auto body shop described him completely differently than how the hippie at the Catalyst described him. With that being said, the owner of the auto body shop gave a phone number and a home address to where John Frazier had previously lived. So the cops go to this address and they find out that his wife, Dolores, still lived there. So they start interviewing and talking to Dolores. She said that John left both her and their daughter and everything was great. He was a great father. He was a great husband till up about a year ago, which is around the time he quit the auto body shop. So a year prior, John was in a car accident where he hit his head and got really injured. And after the car accident, he started getting really religious, started getting into tarot readings. He started doing heavy drugs like LSD and mescaline hallucinogens and he started talking reckless about prophecies and materialism and he ended up leaving his wife and daughter and growing his beard out and moving into the woods after his accident john stopped driving and his wife explained to cops that he explained to her that he cannot drive anymore because he was given a message by the almighty god that if he were to drive anymore he would be killed because when he drives, he's polluting the environment. So John actually moved into the woods into this tiny shack that was only a few miles away from the Otis house. So when they took his picture and started interviewing neighbors, neighbors actually said that they used to see John walking around the woods, even one of them witnessed him climb into a water tower at the top of it and watch the Otis house with binoculars. So he was watching them for some time. He was planning, he was stalking, he was hunting the Otas. So the cops roll up to his shack. They find him asleep in there. And as one of them has a gun pointed at John's head, John looks at them and says, go ahead, why don't you give me what I deserve? They obviously don't shoot him because he's not fighting back. He's not a quote unquote threat. So they arrest him four days after this mass murder. Just four days. No, it's not just four days because any day after a murder is a day, but at least it wasn't four months or four years. So four days is better than that. So they get the gas station attendant to come in. They set up a lineup with a bunch of other people and everyone has to say in the lineup, that's cool, man, because the gas station clerk did not see his face. He only heard his voice. So they're going through the lineup saying, that's cool, man. And the gas station clerk picks out John Frazier by his voice and identifies him as the man that was in the green station wagon. John Lindley Frazier, 24, named by Santa Cruz County Sheriff's investigators Thursday afternoon as a suspect in the murders of Dr. Victor Ota, his wife, two sons, and secretary, was taken into custody at 7.30 this morning as he lay sleeping in a small shack less than a mile from the site of the Monday afternoon evening murders. The six by six foot shack lies across a makeshift bridge at the end of a dirt road heavily wooded canyon separating it from the hilltop Ota mansion. And among the cluster of buildings adjacent to the shack is the trailer where Frazier's mother, Mrs. Patricia Pascal, lives. Deputies say they were led to this location with the help of Frazier's estranged wife, among others, who told them that Frazier had been living in this cabin, but that she had helped him move out of it two days before the slayings. Mrs. Frazier, now in protective custody, has been separated from her husband for several months. Uh, good morning. I have a statement to make. Two of our deputy sheriffs, Brad Arplin and Rod Sanford, were on surveillance in the vicinity of a cabin the suspect has used before. Early this morning, they checked this cabin and found the suspect, Frazier, asleep. They took him into custody without resistance. The suspect was not armed. 
Frazier was transferred to this office and has been booked on the warrant that was issued early last evening. And this warrant charges the suspect with five counts of murder. I'd like to say uh, uh, this kind of off the cuff. I'd like to thank the citizens of Santa Cruz County uh, for their help, and I hope they're as proud as I am of the uh, men and women of this office. As a suspect, thank you. Sheriff, he, he said sheriff, anything. Sheriff, sheriff. There will be no further comment from this office on this matter. So Lark was the older daughter between the two. Lark and Laura were the two surviving daughters. Lark identified possessions that were on John in his shack, and one of the possessions was the binoculars, which Lark confirmed were her father's, which means John was actually in their home weeks before the murder was actually committed, which means this was planned, it was calculated, and he was in fact stalking them. So John decides that he is pleading not guilty for reason of insanity, although he was convinced there was nothing wrong with himself. So when investigators are interviewing John, he tells them God told him that the Otis needed to die because they were too rich and too materialistic and he had to get rid of these people. So although he had his own gun, he did steal the Otas. He tied the scarves in the house in preparation before they got home and he was actually camped out in the family home waiting for everyone to arrive. Virginia, Dr. Oda's wife, was the first to arrive home. That's why her mouth was gagged so she wouldn't scream. And he called Dr. Ota's office to let him know that Virginia's car had trouble and had broken down and she cannot pick the kids up from school. That's why Dorothy, the secretary, brought the first son home and then Dr. Ota picked the other son home on his way home from work. So the next people to arrive at the house were Dorothy and his older son and then it was Dr. Ota and his younger son. When everyone arrived, they were all tied and bound. So while they're tied and bound, John asked Mr. Oda to help him burn down the house. And Dr. Oda's response was, I'll give you anything you want. I'll give you all the money you want. I'll give you anything you want. Just tell me what you want. Which actually set John into a full-blown rage because he was non-materialistic. He realized in his Dr. Ota's mindset always came down to materialistic things and rich things. He was even trying to buy his way out of being killed. So he actually took Dr. Ota down to the pool first. He pushed him into the pool, shot him three times in the back. Then it was Dorothy, the secretary, and his wife, Virginia. He asked Mrs. Ota if she believed in God, and she said yes. And then he told her, then you have nothing to fear, and then continued to shoot her and Dorothy in the neck, and then let their bodies fall into the pool. John told investigators that he really, really struggled with the children. He asked God, he prayed to God, he said, I need an answer, do I need to do this? And he said he received his answer, and that if the father died, the wealth will be passed on to his sons, and therefore he had to kill both of the boys. And they were also shot in the neck and dumped in the pool. It's just a little weird to me that his philosophies revolve around hurting the earth and the environment, but he said entire large kind of mansion home on fire, which if it did set fully ablaze, if, if a lot of his fires didn't go out, would have done more harm to the surrounding environment than good. So he's just a walking ass contradiction. This case obviously went to trial and after just five hours, the jury found him guilty. Frazier himself appeared to be calm as he entered the courtroom. It will be one year ago tomorrow that police spotted a house fire in the remote hill country near Soquel. Five bodies were found at a fashionable hilltop home. That of eye surgeon Dr. Victor Oda, his wife, two children, and a secretary. All shot to death, their hands tied behind them, all dumped in the family swimming pool. A note found at the scene declared World War III on those who misused the environment. It was signed, Knights of Wands, Swords, Pinnacles, and Cups. All cards from the medieval tarot deck used by fortune tellers, a pastime that Frazier was said to have engaged in. Frazier was arrested a few days later while sleeping in a cabin about a mile from the murder scene. This ended a widespread speculation the murders were the work of a hippie commune, this on the heels of the Manson trial. The murder weapon has never been found, and there are no eyewitnesses to the killings. The prosecution's case is believed to be pretty much circumstantial including some conversations Frazier allegedly had with friends prior to the killing. The jury had deliberated only three days after getting the case Friday. At four this afternoon, it returned to Judge Charles Franich's court to give the verdict. Frazier, as he had been throughout the trial, was relaxed, even aloof, sitting with his back turned toward Franich and the jury. 
The verdicts were read one at a time for each murder count in the deaths of Dr. Oda, his wife, two children, and secretary. The readings came in matter-of-fact succession. The people of the state of California versus John Lindley Frazier. Verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant, John Lindley Frazier, guilty of murder in the first degree. It was repeated four times. Throughout, Frazier did not blink. He seemed almost stoic. Now a convicted murderer, Frazier was led from the courtroom while the attorneys that defended and prosecuted him spoke with reporters. He had a second trial, and during his second trial, he did his best to look quote-unquote crazy. He shaved half, to, half his head, half his eyebrow, or just one of his eyebrows left the other. And although he was trying to talk to himself during court and look completely insane, the jury didn't buy it, and they actually voted him guilty and sentenced him to death. He is a murderer. He's a multiple murderer. He's a vicious murderer. And you think he got what he deserved, huh? I think as long as we have the death penalty in the state of California, that uh, this was a very proper death penalty case. Uh, I feel that uh, if he hadn't received the death penalty, that we probably would have shortchanged everybody else on death row. Frazier had said a death sentence would be worth it if it brought more supporters to his revolutionary cause. Pending a Supreme Court ruling on the death sentence, Frazier now goes to San Quentin's death row to await his turn to die in the gas chamber. This is Bill Baessa in Redwood City reporting for Newswatch. On August 15th, 2019, John Lindley Frazier committed suicide in his jail cell. So after 35 years, he carried out his own sentence. Seven years after the Ota family murders, their daughter, one of the survivors, Tora, committed suicide. She had a child of her own, she was married. She took a bunch of pills, she went into the garage, and she tried to sit in a car and get carbon monoxide poisoning. Her mother-in-law actually found her, rushed her to the hospital, but she died a day later. She actually died the day of her younger sister's graduation from Stanford University. Dr. Victor Ota's mother also committed suicide two years after the murders. The only survivor is their daughter, Lark. So that's the story, you guys. That is the true crime and wine. I told Gabby, I was like, I thought a serial killer was someone that like committed like murders like a bunch of murders by random people and I thought mass murder and serial killers were two different things but she's saying that it's not. Nonetheless, the story's really fucked up and it's kind of creepy that people like John Lindley Fraser do walk this earth and do look at other people and assume they know them because of the cars they drive or the scarves they wear or the house they live in and nobody knows anybody. So to live your everyday life and not know that someone has already been in your home, has touched your things, has stolen your belongings, has been sitting on water towers, watching your every move, planning to kill you is very, very eerie in itself. Like, I don't know if security like we have now on homes existed back in the 70s, because now it's like you got the ADT systems and if someone even opens your door or if you set it wrong at night and walk around on the wrong setting, the alarm will go off. So I think times were really different, but just the mere fact that someone could be watching you and you don't even know that somebody's watching you is very nerve wracking. So again, everyone be safe out there. Everyone be smart, pay attention to everyone around you, pay attention if things of yours go missing, because maybe if they notice that a gun was missing and a pair of binoculars, they could have, I don't know, I don't know what they could have done, but it's just terrible. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this true crime and wine. I will see you next week for a new true crime and wine. I'll probably do the other serial killer that was haunting Santa Cruz at the same time as Ed Kemper and John Lindley Frazier and all of them suck. They suck. And f you, John, for having that f name, John, and for being a killer, you piece of Give this video a thumbs up or a thumbs down, but as I always say, if you're giving it a thumbs down, you probably shouldn't be on this channel. But if you are going to be here, make sure you hit that subscribe button, but also hit the bell, because if you don't hit the bell, you will not get notifications, and if you don't get notifications, what is the point? There is none. Also, subscribe to our Wave channel. Link is in the description box. We have other videos on there that we will not be putting on our YouTubes anymore.
Follow me on Instagram, XXO Danielle, Swallow Podcast, the official Victor Twins, Little Caesar the Frenchie, TikTok, XXO Danielle, the official Victor Twins, OnlyFans.com slash XXO Danielle. And I think I got everything down. I don't think I'm, oh, Bigo. I'm now, I now go live on Bigo. So Bigo at XXO Danielle. Just follow me everywhere, y'all. Plug any plug, plug, plug. If you ain't gonna plug yourself, who's gonna plug you? If you're gonna plug yourself, then who's gonna do it for you? That's what I meant to say. Anyways, I love you guys. Be safe, be smart. Don't be a killer, don't be a murderer, don't be these people out here. You don't wanna, it just doesn't make any sense how people, some people are born like good and decent human beings and other people can just be pure evil. It's really actually kind of nerve wracking and horrifying all in the same and makes it kind of hard to sleep at night sometimes so bye guys i love you i really do thanks for being here thanks for supporting me thanks for enjoying my true crime as much as i enjoy doing all this research so next time i ever find someone or marry someone i'm just gonna be like looking at them like are you a serial killer i might even start asking that on first date hey hey before we take this any further are you like a are you like a serial killer? Like, are you Dexter? Are you? Okay. Are you? And they lie to me and I believe them and then they end up being a serial killer and I'm f***ed anyway, but that's besides the point. <laughs> Hopefully all these true crimes will teach us all how to spot a serial killer from a mile away. I just went on a tangent. Bye guys. Seriously, bye this time.